usually how I like to start these conversations is about an individual's journey. And I think when we think of social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, you know, we usually think it, it's sort of new a little bit. It's sort of this new new thing that's sort of trending upward and, and has everybody excited. But you've kind of been in it for a while now, you know, you almost have a lifetime of <laughs> social enterprise experience and social entrepreneurship ship experience. So maybe take us back to when that journey began, when you were sort of first introduced to the idea of a social enterprise and what social entrepreneurship was and what was your first sort of uh, interaction with it? So a little over 20 years ago, I was a software developer mm -hmm. and had developed a children's software, an award-winning piece of software that actually beat Disney in the reviews. <laughs> And it's a very difficult business in the respect that uh, you had to pay for shelf space and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a very competitive, difficult business. And eventually I signed Sammy Sosa to a four-year, four-title deal for a dollar huh. because I wasn't getting anywhere in the traditional marketplace. So I went, well, let's go a different path. And I thought if I could get a big celebrity. So I went after different folks. Nolan Ryan was the first one. And then... Mm -hmm. uh, Mark McGuire, he was really sweet, just said, just too busy right now. Then I went after Sammy Sosa and uh, phoned up his manager in the Dominican Republic. And he said, uh, oh, Sammy likes kids. Yeah, That's good. So it was really quite, it was really quite amazing. So I ended up flying down to Florida to meet him mm -hmm. personally. And the whole idea was that we would, so this is CD-ROM, so this is 20 odd years ago, right? Yeah, and this is this is White Sox Sammy Sosa, or is this Cubs Sammy Sosa? Chicago like, Cubs, Chicago okay, Cubs. Okay, so he's, he's, he's prime, right? I mean, people know who he is at this point. Oh, I'm at sure. this point, he had just finished that big competition in 98. Uh, okay, wow. They, okay, so this they, is, yeah, his peak, big, really. <laughs> that was the peak of his career when he yeah. uh, and Mark McGuire in the big battle to beat the yep. uh, home run record. Yep. And um, so he said, yeah, well, that sounds good. So I uh, flew down to Florida, signed this deal. Unbelievable. And the whole idea was that, you know, we'd give 15% to the Sammy Sosa Foundation. He bought a hospital in the, his hometown and it's a poor country. So sure. we really liked the idea. But unfortunately, what happened, I landed back in uh, Montreal. That's where I was uh, from Vancouver, but I was coming back to where my family's from in Montreal, when the dot bomb hit. So I had been sitting with uh, Ernst and Young on the top floor of the tallest building in Montreal, Place Ville Marie. And they said, you bring Sosa here, I'll raise you 20 million bucks. So I get back there, go to knock on their door and their doors are shuttered. Oh, wow. Yeah, they had been, a whole bunch of investment bankers were charged by the attorney general of the state of New York for illegal practices of pumping up things like for example you know the dot bomb people were just buying website names there was one buyawatch.com yeah they 40 million dollars in yeah. three days and they, they were going public on just a domain name and not really like a product or anything they didn't yeah. have anything. it's it was crazy like, it was crazy and then so all they all got charged so that caused that everything to kind of collapse so i went well that, that didn't really work and um then uh then I went and did some more research. I really was very fascinated with the, the whole idea of, you know, the power of many that you can, you know, rowing a canoe, you know, you pull. Together. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I went to England and did some research on um, social enterprise. Uh, one of my favorite stories was Grayston Bakery, where a, a Jewish investment banker turned Zen Buddhist. Came nice. Back to Yonkers and saw his neighborhood and was just absolutely appalled. He said, well, I've got to do something. So he opened up a bakery. He had been studying bakery as part of his practice. And uh, they're now considered the best cheesecake makers in America. Wow. They basically turned everything around. And I love what he said. He said, you know, we don't bake cakes. Uh, we don't hire people to bake cakes. We bake cakes to hire people. Mm. I went, love it. Yeah. Okay. You just, you know, rang my bell. So that actually later on led to a social enterprise that I did in the downtown east side, the poorest postal code in Canada, and expanded it to um, Cambodia. And our basic uh, moniker was borrowed from them was, you know, we don't hire people to build websites. We build websites to hire people. <laughs> So I, I was, uh, I don't think he, he minded. I've actually never met the man, but I just admire what he has done sure. over the last uh, 20, 30 years. So there, the whole movement sort of really started, you know, back in the 80s. 
And that's when he started, uh, there's another group out of San Francisco, uh, the name escapes me at the moment, but the same thing, they basically built very big enterprises on social purpose. Yeah. And so then I moved along and got involved in um, a literacy project, Shine a Light on Literacy with a, uh, an indigenous uh, health society. And we sold hand crank flashlights at the big PNE festival, Pacific National Ex Exhibit. These crank flashlights could also charge your cell phone. Okay. So, um, that led me to writing a book about uh, indigenous people called A is for Aboriginal. And we used that to raise money for education in the downtown east side. And I then got into social purpose real estate, which has really been my path for the last 16, 17 years. And I've had my pen on about $40 million worth of social housing. Social purpose real estate is very important and uh, it's still uh, very important. Give us an example of what you mean, you know, by your definition of, of social purpose real estate and, and kind of what that last okay. couple decades has been like within that sector. A lot of what I did was basically brought business tools to nonprofit housing. So when you would, for example, say, hey, we can take this property and repurpose it to um, help women with mental illness, for example. But the best example would be Squachay's Lodge, S-K-W-A-C-H-A-Y-S.com, which ended up being chosen as one of the top 100 places on earth to visit in 2018. Hmm. So there was an old decrepit, broken down hotel. We wrote a business plan for a medical stay facility for indigenous people coming from the north and further out in the province to Vancouver for medical treatment. And as part of it, we would create 24 artists live work studios because indigenous artists had particularly at that time were it was a big grain market for indigenous art. And the dealers would often, you know, really, you know, pay 10, 20 cents on the dollar. It wasn't mm -hmm. fair, fair trade whatsoever. So the idea was let's get a revenue generating medical stay facility, have 24 artists live work studios and put in a fair trade gallery. So that was great. We got raised 10 million bucks. We had it built. We opened wow. it up. Oh, yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> And just prior to that, we'd done a huge mural, the largest mural in Western Canada, which led to our very first art gallery, the Raven's Eye Studio, an artist-led gallery. But we saw that, you know, there's an opportunity here to get the artists with, you know, affordable housing, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, um, fair trade, et cetera, and connect to the larger community through the medical state facility. Unfortunately, the medical state facility didn't work because Health Canada had promised to take uh, half of the rooms, about a half a million in revenue a year, and pulled out at the last minute. Huh. So there we were. <laughs> just We've just opened up. It's amazing. It's beautiful. We put a 40-foot pole on top. The, there's a lodge, a beautiful modern design, uh, stainless steel etched whale design at the top. And in behind that is a sweat lodge, a traditional sweat lodge on top of the building, and a smudge room. So it's a, a very yep. sacred place. But unfortunately, the um, Health Canada pulled out. So we had to switch gears literally in a matter of a week. We had to say, okay, let's turn it into a hotel. So we, wow. uh, we had friends in the hotel game, and they, and they showed us how booking.com works. <laughs> and within a week, we were open. Fortunately, this was, you know, because we opened on June 11th, 2012. So the summer is a really good time to have a hotel. And so we really immediately just started selling it as a sort of a hotel. But once the season ended, um, right. winter came, no one knew who the heck we were. We were kind of plain Jane. And the story goes on. Someone else actually just by uh, serendipity came in and said, well, why don't you turn it into an arts and culture hotel? Interesting. Love it. That great was idea. Fun. Yeah, it was a great idea. And this uh, man by the name of John Zwickel, uh, who was sort of a semi-retired hotelier, hotelier, whatever. Um, and he uh, came back and said uh, to the CEO, David Eddy, yeah, you could turn that into an arts and culture hotel. Of course, we asked how much. He said, I don't know, half a million, 700,000. So we laughed. <laughs> said, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to happen. We're already like a half a million in the hole just from day one here. Sure. Uh, 
and, and there was a mortgage on, on the building as well as part of the finance plan. Uh, and that money, that mortgage was based upon the, the, you know, selling the hotel rooms and getting that contract with Health Canada. But anyway, he, this gentleman came back and said, okay, well, I'll help you out. And he went out and got six designers who um, worked with uh, half a dozen Indigenous artists. They came up and created art installations for each of the 18 hotel rooms. And it's one wow. of the most beautiful hotels on the planet. That's why I think Time Magazine shows it as one of the 100 greatest places to visit. It really is an art experience. So a visitor to the hotel can meet the artists that live and work in the hotel, that display huh. art in the hotel. Um, so it's got this whole sort of, sort of organic interconnectedness that really works. And so there's an example of how you can kind of take a need, yeah. do the financial analysis to say, you know, will this work? Will the numbers work? Because that's the first thing in social enterprise. Of course, yeah. yeah. Do the numbers work? If not, you know, you're, you're basically a charity with your hand out. Yep. And, you know, people need a hand, hand up, not a hand out is sort of my philosophy. So this is a very successful model. The gallery, you know, is fed by the hotel. The hotel feeds the gallery. The gallery feeds the artist. The artist feeds the, the gallery. It's a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful form of, of capitalism, right? It's a beautiful form of business. It's a beautiful form of creativity. It's, it's, it's the best of what I think, uh, you know, business has to offer it is sort of this, this perfect storm of what has been created through this, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just a great blend of, uh, of a lot of different elements that, that make up like what I, what I hope social enterprise is defined by is something like this. Absolutely. And there, and there's many, you know, from catering. Sure. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, like that, that's the whole thing. This, this actually is a movement. And the next step of course is all well and good to have social enterprises, but you need the customer base. Yep. So yep. we're part we're part of Buy Social Canada, uh, Buy Social USA, uh, Good Market Global. So and it's a growing field, and uh, many municipalities, for example, are uh, implementing things like uh, community contribution agreements and getting their purchasing departments to say, you know, look at buying and building community. Look for you know price competitive, quality products that you can buy from social enterprises, social purpose businesses, and make it part of your uh, ongoing purchasing activities. Well, especially, so especially, sorry to cut you off, but I, I think, I think that it's such a, a profound example because now more than ever, I think we're going to need innovative solutions like this because there's going to be just endless small businesses and restaurants that are going to need to find a way to adapt you know, especially here in America, right? I mean, Canada might be a little different, but we're in the same boat. We're going to have a slew of, of small businesses just get decimated and, and go out of business. And it's going to be just devastating to, you know, local communities, local neighborhoods who, you know, frankly, that's where, that's where I live. You know, I live where, you know, we walk up the street and there's nothing but local restaurants. Right. And that's the beauty of it. And for that to go away, it, it just scares me quite frankly. Right. And, and it's, uh, and we need to find innovative solutions in, in real estate with, with local government and try to figure out a way where this stuff just doesn't shut down because of, you know, obviously because of, of COVID. So anyway, I, I just, uh, I just think it's, again, it's, it's an example uh, where you kind of had to scramble to figure out an idea and, and look what came out of it. I think we're, we're almost in that same position here, just at a bigger scale. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the creativity of individuals can step up to the plate and we can build back better if we have learned the lesson that, you know, the, the, the frontline workers saved our behinds. Yeah. You know, and we need to respect that. We don't just push it away and forget it. Like I take the example of the farmers in uh, Cambodia. That's why I'm so interested in this path is that, you know, they already had in the 1970s, Pol Pot, you know, made mm -hmm. pepper farming punishable by death. And then his rebels set up camp in an area where I actually live, Phnom Vor village. Uh, they were in the Vor mountains for another 20 years, so they couldn't grow any pepper. They came back and when they were ousted in 1999, they grew two tons in the year 2000. Last year, they grew about 90 tons. So they're coming back, but nothing like the 3000 tons from 1960. So let's, let's just, this is, I mean, this is a good segue now into kind of what your, your big sort of project is now. Right. So take us to, through how 
you end up, you know, in Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way then in, in Cambodia. How does that happen, right? And then how do you get embedded into this sort of global pepper market, right? And, and trying to, to sort of spread the word about uh, these Cambodian farmers and, and fair trade and, and how this all works to to sort of develop this system of, you know, buying pepper to give back to food banks here here locally, right? There, there's such a great dynamic to all of it. Well, the Squatch Eyes project, Squatch Eyes actually is an indigenous uh, Salish word for the, the, na- the name actually of the land upon which it sits. And that project from beginning to end, to, like, you know, from conception to opening day mm-hmm. was uh, about eight years. Wow. And, and the actual from, you know, breaking ground, like getting the money in place was the big thing. Once we broke ground and opened up, it was just about a year. We did about a million dollars in cultural enhancement, just some of the most beautiful art you're ever going to see. But at the end of it, I was supposed to go on a trip. Okay, good. We're open. You know, my job's yeah. done. I'm going off on a trip. I'm tired. Yeah. I need, I need <laughs> sure. a break. But then when Health Canada pulled out, it was like, oh, no, I got to stick around for until we get this thing going. So we stuck around, got, got it kind of set up for um, as a hotel uh, marketing. Uh, we opened in June 11th, 2012. Then we had to scramble. Yeah, so it was eight years from conception to opening. Then we lost the Health Canada contract, so we had to spend another six months just uh, scrambling and putting it back on its feet. And that's when I went, okay, I need a trip. So I hadn't been back to Southeast Asia for quite a few years, so I did a, a little itinerary of Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and just fell in love with Cambodia. Interesting. And so, yeah, I went to... Uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and then went, oh, I'll go back to Cambodia. I went back to Cambodia, and uh, I just fell in love with the place, and I went to a little seaside town called Kep, K-E-P, um, on the Gulf of Thailand, and I'd heard in Phnom Penh, the capital city, about this little restaurant called Kim Lee's, and I was told, you've got to try their sailfish with green pepper. So, I went there, ordered it, and I basically floated out of my chair. <laughs> I went, oh, my God, that's the most delicious flavor I've ever had. <laughs> like, I am a pepper lover. I love okay. pepper. My okay. favorite, it's my go-to spice. And, you know, I, I tend to buy, you know, the better quality whole peppercorns because you definitely don't want to use ground pepper because as soon as you grind it, Within three hours, the pepperine evaporates, loses its taste and flavor. All no chefs use ground pepper. They all grind their pepper either in a mortar and pestle or with a, uh, a grinder. And then I went and said, "Okay, well, I'll go find a, a farmer. I pick some up on the side of the road. It's a big business there. Uh, sure, just like lots of people growing peppers. So I started bringing it back. And then some of my social enterprise work led me back to uh, Cambodia." I went back there just a second time because I really loved it. Then I opened up the DTES, the Digital Technology Education Society, where we were doing websites, uh, teaching WordPress to uh, young uh, Cambodian students. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. And DTES actually stands for Downtown East Side. So that's the poorest postal code in Canada. And we repurposed the name. So to DTES.org, because we started out this project teaching uh, indigenous youth uh, web skills. And so Digital Technology Education Society. So we had a, a partnership with USAID in Cambodia. Beautiful. Yeah, it was a really one sort of organic, it all just happened very organically. Then I did a large um, software project in uh, Cambodia as a result of that. But all the while I'm going back just home. Eating, eating but, peppers, eating peppers all the while, huh? Yeah, just, just like, it's not peppers, it's, it's actually peppercorn. So peppercorn, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's pepper. right. So the first time, I, I think I brought up like maybe a half a kilo back with me. So then, you know, it, it ended up, I'm going there three, four times a year, and everyone that knows me, I'm, you know, gifting them like, you know, 20 grams, 50 grams, whatever. I said, bring more of that pepper back. My mother pepper brings some more back. So eventually, yeah, I'm bringing back like kilos. And then one trip, I went, hmm, should do a fundraiser with my local foundation. Yeah, right, and right. Every, everyone's just going, oh, that's the best pepper in the world. Once you, uh, once you taste it, no other pepper will do. And we did the little fundraiser. And in a half an hour, we raised like 600 bucks. Uh-huh. So I went back 
the next time and sort of did a little tour around the pepper growing region and did some research. And that's when I found out that from 79 to 99, the end of Pol Pot to the final um, expulsion of the rebels was 20 years. Wow. So they couldn't grow any peppers. So that region, you know, has 70% poverty. There's all kinds of really uh, difficult things, child labor, very bad dental and general health, low educational quality and availability, domestic violence because of the poverty. Sure, um, sure. Just is, the, is, the, is the peppercorn industry the biggest sort of job creator? Um, not really, no. It, it's a relatively small, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a significant business, but no, it's, it's okay. not, not even 5%, not even wow. 3% of the like regular business, which is, you know, shopkeepers, drinking, sure, sure, uh, sure. milk, tea, et, et cetera, beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a solid business. And they have PGI, Protected Geographical Indication, which they gained in um, 2016. What does that mean exactly? So Protected geog Geographical Indication means that you're on the same footing as other appellations of origin like Champagne. Mm, okay. Bordeaux, Darjeeling. You can only be Campot Pepper if you're from Campot. Gotcha. Okay. Like the bourbon exactly. whiskey thing in America, huh? Like, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 What's unique about Campot Pepper is it's the terroir. Basically, it's the distance from the mountains, the amount mm. of rainfall, mm. uh, the temperature. And in particular, um, it's the quartz laden clay soil. So this all comes together to produce this one exquisite product that can only be grown in two provinces in Cambodia, Kep and Kampot province. They've tried to replicate the experience in different parts of Cambodia. They certainly grow and they produce a, a good pepper, but it's nothing like Kampot pepper. Sure, sure. So it so really how, has... Well, you know, how, did you, how did you go from, you know, doing research around to, you know, raising $600, but then now actually sort of building... A, a business around it right one thing to and and like you said you had your you had bandwidth with other areas right so did you have to like set some other things aside to actually go all in on this um, uh, yes okay yes. so first of all as i did the financial modeling you know i looked at what you know campot pepper was selling for in, in france germany switzerland japan australia it wasn't a lot happening in north america and that's when i went oh interesting there's an opportunity here challenge yeah. and an opportunity because no one's ever heard of it but right. once you get people to try it uh, then you know the doors open uh the first thing it took me 19 months to figure out once i decided i was going to do it then i had to figure out how to get it to canada so that means logistical and legal and uh, bureaucratic stuff all had to be done but prior to that i sort of had this just a vision i went well pretty much like what i was doing with the Sammy Sosa presents at bat, the software, is that the consumer buys it, a portion goes to right. a worthy cause. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it just, you know, uh, food security has always been something that I've always been interested in, you know, looking at. And so I went, well, you know, if we can just remove a number of steps in the sales channel and basically just have the farmer have a, an e-commerce and fulfillment platform and then partner with community organizations it's just really simple, internet-based, you know, a, a social purpose Amazon type of solution that connects small grower farmers with worthwhile causes mm -hmm. uh, across the ocean. So I built a prototype, uh, you know, coming from the software field, I built a prototype delivery system and it started working. Then I uh, uh, approached the Union Protein Project, a brilliant project. Uh, 40 unions got together after they had asked the food banks what do you need? <laughs> and they said, we need cheaper protein. So the outgoing president uh, of the Allied and Fishermen's Union at that time in 2006 went to the canners and said, here's the situation. Can you help? And they said, absolutely. If we have inventory, we can sell it to you at cost or below. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So he then turned around and went to the membership and said, you know, let's throw in some cash for the members and reduce the, the cost even more, and then provide it to the food banks. So they supply about 110 food banks. One more thing they did was they um, went to a large grocer here called Save On Foods or Overweight Eat Foods. Mm -hmm. 
and talk to them. So basically what happens is they buy, say, a container of protein, tuna, salmon, peanut butter. It comes into the distribution center and is sent out for free by this big grocer, Interesting. grocery chain. So it's just a brilliant model. I approached them. So, well, here, you know, let's add uh, Campot pepper and uh, 35% of the proceeds will go to you guys. We've increased that to 50% during COVID just because uh, we really need to, to be quite honest. So it was actually funny The Scott Lunny, the uh, president of uh, the new president of Union Protein Project said, you know, you're the first guy who ever came into my office and offered me money. <laughs> <laughs> you become a good friend pretty quickly, huh? Yeah, he's like, okay, so let's do it. So let's work uh, together. <laughs> well, that, that's sort of the the big the, the big picture of how how it sort of came came up uh, to be. We're now building uh, our own custom platform. Like, right, the, our present platform is sort of a hodgepodge of you know open source software solutions, mm -hmm. We're bringing that whole thing together. And our long term vision, of course, is not just the 450 farmers that uh, pepper farmers, but the half a million or a million smallholder organic spice growers on the planet. You know, this is a scalable solution that can, you know, lift people out of poverty. Instead of now, what's happening with the farmers, they're losing their farms because the big growers yep. are um, not buying the pepper anymore, they're buying the farms. Yep, yep. And that's just not on. So what our long-term vision is to create uh, enough uh, revenue and partnerships that we can have a, uh, what we call a spice bank. So we can actually fund the growth of the smallholders, get them directly to the market. They get a fair trade price. The market gets access to the best products on the planet. And this fights food insecurity. Amazing. Other, and other causes. Of course. Well, all the ancillary call, ancillary issues you talked about before, right? When when you sort of have poverty alleviation, then you have more education, less domestic violence, less depression, less mental illness. There's there's such there's so you know many uh, cause and effects that happen in a positive way, right? When you have you know a, an economy in these these small regions that is actually you know doing well, right? That, that there's so many positive effects from it, and we often think that it's very difficult sometimes to to solve poverty but it can be as easy as just buying this peppercorn right like there's there's actually easy solutions to a lot of big issues and i think it just takes creative thinking right to you know a, a guy from a, a guy from vancouver going there and, and, and doing something <laughs> like this right like it, it just there there's we can do this as individuals and, and entrepreneurs and creative thinkers and not depend on you know governments a lot of times to to kind of to do these things that they're not just well equipped to do, right? You know, solve poverty is one of them, right? And it's, uh, I think it's it's our job as, as creative thinkers to uh, to solve these problems. And it's just uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. And it's it's it's. Uh, I hope you keep the the greatest domain name of all time, bestpeppereverever.com. Is, is that going to be? Are we well, changing for, that, or is that going to be the is that going to be the the home base? Um, well, that's our beginning. So, you know, we really have to uh, secure the the farmers. The farmers absolutely need need help right now. The uh, and best pepper ever is the perfect domain because it's, it's so great. It, it's it, so tells, great. it tells the story because really the, the the first thing it's the pepper. It's these people. You know, they've been growing this pepper for a thousand years or more, and you know, this is a traditional process it's organic they use bat guano and uh, hand watering every single peppercorn is touched by a human being unbelievable have it you, is unbelievable have you spoken with like uh restaurant industry leaders and and try to get there's a lot of great celebrity chefs out there that that do a lot for their communities where they come from as well i, I wonder if that's an industry that you've spoken with to where we want the best fruit right we want the best fish or we want the best lettuce or the best tomato, the best whatever, right at, at these restaurants that are, that are high quality, why not have the best pepper there as well? Has, has there been any interaction with the restaurant industry or, or, or chefs that, that may be doing, you know, projects themselves that, that could be interested in stuff like this? I have definitely reached out to quite a number of, uh, you know, well-known celebrity chefs, uh, both locally, nationally, and internationally. But to be quite honest, I'm this little guy. Mm -hmm. in north vancouver yeah 
who's ever heard of him? You know, like it just, you, there are gatekeepers to get through to these uh, people. Sure. And as yet, I haven't done that, but I do not give up the hope that I know eventually, you know, it's like penguins on an iceberg. <laughs> they all stand at the edge of the iceberg looking there, leaning forward, right? I'm not going in. I'm not going in. Are you going in? I'm going in. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, one makes the dive, and then 30, 50, 100, 200 go in. So I'm looking for my first penguin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think building out the products, like you said, building out the sort of supply chain, the, the digital brand to me is it's always important for me, right? But building that out, perfecting that, making that you know, noticeable, that's what really you're selling, right? It's not even about you, right? So it, it's really you want the, the pepper to be the focal point, right? You kind of just want to be in the background. So as much as you can lift, you know, and get that term best pepper ever out into the world, right? And in the ether, that's what's going to gravitate people towards it, right? There's only so much you can do, right? But a beautiful brand and, and a website and a product and a story, you know, that could reach people 24 seven, you know, 365 days. You can't do that. I can't do that. No. So we're basically on the same page here. It's the pepper. Yeah. It's the <laughs> Once pepper. people taste it, there's no going back. It is absolutely the best pepper in the world. And, you know, the late Anthony Bourdain raved about it. There's so many international chefs that know the product and use the product. And, you know, it's been known for a century or plus in France. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a remarkable product. I feel very fortunate that, you know, I've been able to work with this collective of over 400 farmers to uh, bring, you know, this exquisite uh, culinary experience to North America. And eventually, people will catch on, you know, mm -hmm. early adopters. Mm -hmm. Some celebrity chef's going to hear about this. Maybe it will be from your podcast and go, mm -hmm. oh, I better get me some of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So usually, usually I like to, to end on a little bit of, uh, of the future. So when, when does it look like, you know, the new platform will be out and, and a lot of these things that we talked about, is that, is it very soon or is it still a ways away? Like how can, like when, what, what part of the process and the journey are we in right now to get to that next level? Okay. So we're probably six weeks before launching the new platform. But we are up and running at, you know, bestpepperever.com yep. and, and our 50millionmeals.com. So anyone can go and buy pepper today. Yep. So the functionality is there. I mean, it took me 19 months to figure out the logistics. And I have, you know, over a half a ton of pepper in inventory. Unbelievable. So, yeah, I'm hoping to have a good Christmas. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to turn that right around and buy more, buy a few more tons of pepper and really help out these farmers. So really, we're ready for Christmas. We've got, uh, I've got a social purpose packager that uh, we're gonna work with called Starworks. They hire disabled people to uh, do the packaging. Yep. Like we, we try to embed social purpose into absolutely everything we do. And so once people taste the pepper, they'll go, oh, I love that. <laughs> go, because, back real, go back sorry? real quick to the, to the 50 million meals and, and kind of define that a little bit and, and what, What's that sort of overarching idea and, and sort of how do, we, how do we get there? That's based on pepper sold and then meals given based on pepper sold, right? And, and eventually the 50 million meals will sort of be given away as a byproduct of people buying the pepper, correct? Exactly. So, okay. you know, I did my homework. You know, I wanted to find out, you know, how many grams of pepper does the average North American consume? And it's 217. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a definitive number that I can figure out. Multiply that through, if we can win one-tenth of one percent of the pepper market for your tabletop choice, make it Campot Pepper, that will fund up to 50 million meals a year because as Feeding America states, they can deliver 10 meals for every dollar you give them because of their extensive networks. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. basically, we can provide 50 million meals a year by simply winning that small percentage of the pepper market. Amazing. Yeah, if someone goes to, you know, www.50millionmeals.com, a $10 purchase of pepper will yield up to $20 of protein at retail. So that's the Interesting. other equation. It is. With it. So I'm very honored to be working with Union Protein Project. And the farmers, 
I mean, they're the heroes in this story. You know, sure, they, sure. They, they resuscitated an industry virtually destroyed during the Cambodian genocide. And, you know, they stuck to their guns. They, you know, grow this beautiful product, uh, you know, that's generations and generations and generations, you know, it's just, uh, it's wonderful to work with those folks. And I think if we can take this model and succeed, which I believe we will probably sooner rather than later, and then go to all the other smallholder organic spice growers on the planet, we can, do something significant and potentially deliver a billion meals a year. Pretty powerful, man. <laughs> Pretty powerful stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Joseph, for taking the time. Uh, well, thank it's, you, Grant. It's an incredible, I mean, it's an incredible journey. It's an incredible story. And I think it's, you know, I always, I always love hearing these stories where you just, you could be just doing one thing in life, right? And you never know where you end up, right? <laughs> like, like if you would have told you, you know, 25 years ago, you would be sort of, on this sort of crusade, right? You would probably laugh, right? And be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, <and> it's, <laughs> what are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I just think it's such a, it's such a great thing about how our, our, our lives could take a, a trajectory that we never thought possible. But uh, sometimes things just pull you, man. You know, yeah. sometimes you, you can't, you can't deny passion sometimes. And, and when that stuff tugs on you and, and it, it finds a way to pull you there and, and there's no denying it, it seems like, you know, that's happened in your life. So uh, thanks for taking the time to tell us the story and uh, best of luck the rest of this year. And I 